Most of us who are well, at least 25 years or older can remember precisely where we were on September 11th, 2001. That day is forever etched in our memories. We remember the news reports. Probably even as I'm talking, you can envision the, 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 the flying planes that crashed into the Twin Towers or the Pentagon or the one plane that crashed into the field in Pennsylvania after the hijackers were overthrown. You probably also remember that George Bush, the president of the United States at that time, was sitting in a Sarasota grade two classroom when his aides came up to him and word was spoken in his ear. And probably you can even remember the news, the pictures of George Bush getting the word about September 11th. The somber look that fell over his face. The ashen look that he had. And what followed in the days uh, ahead were quite shaking. Planes had been grounded. People were stranded all over the world. The airspace around the world virtually stopped. And our lives have been forever etched and changed. While we often forget history, there are certain moments of history we never forget. Because in those moments of terror that come upon us, they change our lives forever. It's now normal for us to take off shoes at the airport. It's normal to go through security clearance. And it's normal to stand like this as a screening device in the U.S. airport scans your body. It's normal to go through much more rigorous procedures for security, even to go to a hockey game or a baseball game. These have become part of the norm of our lives, and 9-11 changed our world in dramatic ways. They, there are moments of our history we forget, but there are those moments that are forever etched in our lives because they reshape a culture and our world. For the Jewish people, it was the summer of 586 B.C. that was their 9-11. It was their moment of catastrophe when the Babylonians, they who had surrounded Jerusalem for two and a half years, had enclosed upon the city and had built an embankment and were basically starving the people inside so that nothing could get in or come out unless they were willing to submit to the Babylonians. And, and 586, in July of 586 BC, the Jerusalem walls were finally breached by the Babylonians and the city was brought to ruin. On August 14th, just a month later, the temple, the sacred place of Jewish worship, the center of Israel's identity was burned and destroyed. And August 14th of 586 BC became the 9-11 for the Jewish people. It's in this context that Jeremiah speaks. Jeremiah is speaking in a day of impending doom, and he lives at the time in Jerusalem as it is being besieged, as the Babylonians are pressing in and closing it off, as famine besets the, the city. And Jeremiah speaks a word, and we're told in Jeremiah 1.1 who he is. He is, first of all, we're told the son of Hilkiah. Now, two weeks ago, when we were reading the story of Josiah in 2 Kings chapter 22 and 23, we saw Hilkiah before. He was the one who had found the scroll, the word of the Lord, in the temple. And so Jeremiah is the son of this high priest. We're told that he's from Ananoth, the, uh, the city where, where the descendants of Eli would have been exiled during the days of King Solomon. That the priests who had been unfaithful to Solomon had been exiled to Anathoth. And so we know that Jeremiah comes from a very important priestly family. And yet Jeremiah, as he lives in these final days of Jerusalem, he is given a word of warning and a word of hope for those who are about to experience exile. And as we consider exile this morning as a theme, that the Bible really, it, this, this becomes a massive theme throughout the Old Testament, this latter part of the Old Testament. We need to understand what is the word of warning and what is the word of hope to us in days of great distress and trial. 
We've had our own Covidian exile, if you would, where we've been isolated and sent our own ways into our own homes. And we need to hear a word of warning, and we need to hear a word of hope that exists for us in this day. So two things I want us to see. And the first is I want us to see that the word of warning is a warning to examine ourselves. When Jeremiah is called, he is given this, he's, he's almost like a Moses-like figure. He doesn't feel that he has the competency or ability to speak, and yet the Lord says, I'm going to put my words in your mouth, Jeremiah, and you're going to speak. And he gives him a vision, and he asks him, what do you see? And Jeremiah sees this, this boiling, or the Hebrew word there is like a smoking, steaming pot that's spilled over. And as the pot is spilled over, it comes from the north and is sweeping down. This, this boiling, steaming fog is coming over to the south. And what Jeremiah is told in chapter 1, verses 14 through 16, is that this is what is going to happen to Jerusalem, to the southern kingdom of Judea. That just as the Babylonians are growing in strength and power, they're going to run over and overflow the land of Judah from the north to the south, and Judah will be taken into exile. Why? Why will Israel and Judah be punished? We find out precisely why in chapter 1, but also in chapter 2, in chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, the Lord says these words, and I'll just give you the references. You just keep flipping in your Bibles. Jeremiah 2, verses 12 and 13. This is what the Lord says. He says, Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. This is the Lord calling heaven and earth as covenant witnesses that his covenant has been broken. How has it been broken? For my people have committed two evils. One, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And two, they have hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that hold no water. Now what this simply means is that in an exchange of the worship of God, what Israel has chosen to do is instead of finding all of their joy and satisfaction in the Lord, what they have found satisfaction in is broken cisterns that can hold no water. This is what idols are. Idols don't give you lasting pleasure. Idols don't give you lasting joy. But you might wonder, well, what about the reforms under Josiah, as we saw a couple weeks ago? What happened when Josiah had brought about all these changes? In Jeremiah 3, verse 10, we are told that it was for all of this, for all of her treacherous sister, Judah did not return to me, Jeremiah 3, 10. She did not return to me with her whole heart, but in pretense, declares the Lord. And this was Israel and Judah's problem, that when they were called to return to the Lord, it was done with external acts, but not with an internal heart. That Their heart was far from God. They did not worship God. But idol worship was not just some sort of private affair. This is what people want to do. They want to privatize worship, and they want to say, well, what you do in terms of your worship, it shouldn't have any effect on anything else. But private worship always has public implications. Always. You cannot disconnect the worship and the things that your heart adores from what you value and what you do. And what had happened in the days of Jeremiah is that the people had begun to scorn the word of the Lord. We see this in chapter 6, verse 10. We hear these words. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ears are uncircumcised. They cannot listen. Behold, the word of the Lord is to them an object of scorn. They take no pleasure in it. This is what has happened. The people have despised what God has said. They have no regard for God's word. And the result of their scorning is that instead of listening to the word of the Lord, who do they listen to? In chapter 5, verses 30 and 31, the Lord says this, An appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule at their direction. My people love to have it so, but what will you do when the end comes? Here we've got lying prophets. They, they tickle ears. They tell the people what they want to hear. And what do they tell the people what they want to hear? We'll see in a few minutes that what they tell the people is that things are going to be okay. There's no problem. 
But in the meantime, the problem that we find is that Israel has broken all of the covenant of God, the covenant that He gave them at Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, God had given them commands, and those commands were very clear. But Israel and Judah chose to go a different way. In Jeremiah 7, verses 10 through 11, uh, Jeremiah 7, verses 9 through 11, sorry, we're told that they tr trust in deceptive words, and it says, Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We're delivered! only to go on doing as all these abominations? Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. You see how the list of the Ten Commandments there is just trotted out? This is what the people have done. They've broken the commands. And then they come to worship. They've disconnected their life from their worship, that, that they're coming before God and asking for blessing and joy and prosperity while they disregard all of God's commands. They want all of God's blessings. They want the gift of His hand, but they do not want to seek His face. And the result of this, we're told in chapter 7, verse 31, that what the people do, it has very public implications what the people do is that they offer their own children to the gods. Chapter 7, verse 31. They have built the high places of Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come into my mind. This is what a culture of destruction does. The most vulnerable and the most innocent. It, it eliminates them. And it puts no value upon even the children whom are who are born. For 45 chapters, the Lord speaks words of warning to Israel. This is what you've done. Look at what you've done. Look at how you've turned away from me. Look at how you have followed after other gods. And the problem that Israel has is not one, first and foremost, of public policy but of a heart that doesn't want God. But the heart will find all sorts of ways, all sorts of ways to justify its wicked and evil behavior. This is why Jeremiah 17, 7, one of the most famous verses of Jeremiah, is that it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? That when problems come, Human nature is that we want to justify ourselves and find why the problem is out there and not with us. We look at every opportunity to say, that's the problem. But when the word of the Lord comes, do you know what the word of the Lord does? It calls us to examine ourselves and to test us to see if we are in the faith. To, to see if our hearts have been aligned with the Lord. Or have we only followed God in pretense, as Jeremiah 3.10 says. Do we follow God in pretense? Or, and do we justify all of the problems of the world by saying, it's out there, it's out there, it's not me. Or do we take a serious and good hard look at our own lives? And do we look at us? Lest we think that we're better than all of the others, even Jeremiah has this struggle. In Jeremiah 12, you don't need to turn there, but in Jeremiah 12, he laments at the Babylonians coming and overrunning the city, and he asks, what about the Babylonians? And the word of the Lord that comes to him is, I'll deal with Babylon in due time, which is chapters 46 through 52. But in the meantime, there are 45 chapters that are calling for self-examination. Do we lament our culture more than we lament the waywardness of our own hearts? Do we lament the direction of our world more than we lament the sin that is within the church? Are we appalled at the sexual abuse scandals that go on and yet fail to miss 
the abuse that has gone on in many churches and don't call it out. The Lord calls us to a, a deep self-examination. A deep self-examination in times of trial and difficulty and exile. And this is what the word of the Lord is. Which is why the Lord will say to Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 12, verse 7, I have forsaken my house. I have abandoned my heritage. I have given the beloved of my soul into the hands of her enemies. That when there isn't self-reflection and a turning to God, there is judgment. And judgment, as Paul will say, must begin with the household of God. And so it's right in a world where we feel like everything is chaotic, instead of looking at the government and blaming public health officials and getting upset about these pieces of cloth that we have over our mouths, for us to take a deep look at ourselves. How are we contributing to the problem? How are we part of the, the, the issues that are going on today? Before we begin with criticisms out there, what about us? What about us? Are we prepared to do that deep self-examination in the midst of COVIDian exile? Are we willing to do that? We need to do that first and foremost. Because the word of warning is that if we will not heed the word of the Lord, there is a discipline that comes. So we ought to examine ourselves. But the second thing I want us to see is that in the midst of exile, what does the Lord call us to do? He does call us to establish a presence. In Jeremiah 1 verse 12, the Lord gives this word of judgment to Jeremiah. And he says to Jeremiah, I'm giving you this word and I'm going to watch over my word of judgment to perform it. My word of judgment will come to pass and I'm calling you to speak it. And in the face of this threat... What Jeremiah calls the people to do is actually quite remarkable. In Jeremiah 21, verse 9, what the Lord tells Jeremiah to do is speak to Israel, and Jeremiah says this word, He who stays in this city, Jerusalem, shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. But he who goes out and surrenders to the Chaldeans, or the Babylonians, who are besieging you shall live and shall have his life as a prize of war. In other words, what Jeremiah is saying, you could fight the culture war all you want, but if you fight the culture war, you're going to die. Because this city is surrounded and you are going to die. But if you surrender to those who are around you, you're going to live. Now this message... This message is not a popular message. <laughs> Jeremiah is called a traitor of the state. He is called a betrayer of the covenant of God. And yet Jeremiah says, no, no, no. I'm not a betrayer. I'm not a betrayer because I am faithfully speaking the word of the Lord. And as he speaks the word of the Lord, he is saying surrendering to the Babylonians is not... It's not deserting God nor His covenant promises. Jeremiah 37, verses 14 and following. It says this, Jeremiah said, It's a lie. I am not deserting to the Chaldeans. But Iridiah would not listen to him and seized Jeremiah and brought him to the officials. And the officials were enraged at Jeremiah and they beat him and imprisoned him in the house of Jonathan the secretary for it had been made a prison. When Jeremiah had come to the dungeon cells and remained there many days, King Zedekiah sent for him and received him. The king questioned him secretly in his house and said, Is there any word from the Lord? And Jeremiah said, There is. Then he said, You shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon. Jeremiah also said to, the kings, to King Zedekiah, What wrong have I done to you or your servants or this people that you have put me in prison? Where are your prophets who prophesied to you, saying, The king of Babylon will not come against you and against this land? Now hear, O oh please, my lord, the king, let my humble plea come before you, and do not send me back to the house of Jonathan the secretary, lest I die there. 
Jeremiah is saying, listen, there have been prophets who have been running around saying, peace, peace. This has been chapter 6, verse 11, uh, 14, or chapter 8, verse 11. There are prophets who are running around saying, peace, peace, when there's going to be no peace. And Jeremiah is saying, I had the word of the Lord. He put it into me. It's like fire in my bones. I have to prophesy this word, even if it means that I'm imprisoned, even if it means I'm put in the stocks and mocked, even if I'm thrown into a dungeon. Regardless, I've got to preach this word. But even when Jeremiah does preach this word and he says, surrender to the Babylonians, it doesn't help when the walls are breached of Jerusalem and King Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, comes in. And in Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 11 and 12, we're told that, what does King Nebuchadnezzar do to Jeremiah? He treats him well. Now, when you've been called a traitor, when you've been faithful to the message of the word of the Lord, when you're saying that disaster is coming and it'd be better to surrender, and then that foreign king comes in and he treats you well, does that really help your cause? Do you look like you're a faithful prophet of the Lord? No. You look like you've been played by the Babylonians, that the Babylonians have been using you. And yet, why does Jeremiah suffer? Because, as Jeremiah 26 says, he's devoted to this word of the Lord that the Lord is going to perform Jeremiah 26, verses 8 through 15. And when Jeremiah had finished speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to all the people, then the, all, then the priests and all the prophets and all the people laid hold of him, saying, You shall die. Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitant? All the people gathered around Jeremiah in the house of the Lord, when the officials of Judah heard these things, they came up from the king's house to the house of the Lord and took their seat in the entry of the new gate of the house of the Lord. Then the priests and the prophets said to the officials and to all the people, This man deserves the sentence of death because he has prophesied against this city as you have heard with your own ears. Then Jeremiah spoke to all the officials and to all the people saying, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and this city all the words that you have heard. Now therefore mend your ways and your deeds and obey the voice of the Lord your God and the Lord will relent of the disaster that he has pronounced against you. But as for me, behold, I'm in your hands. Do with me as seems good and right to you. Only know for certain that if you put me to death, you will bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon this city and its inhabitants. For in truth, the Lord sent me to you to speak all these words in your ears." This doesn't mean that in speaking these words that Jeremiah has delight that all these things are going to happen. In fact, when Jeremiah gets all these words of the Lord in Jeremiah 20, verses 7 through 10, do you know what he says? Oh Lord, you've deceived me. I was deceived. You are stronger than I, and you've prevailed. You've, I have become a laughingstock all the day. Everyone mocks me, for whenever I speak, I cry out, I shout out, violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has come for me, a reproach, a derision, all the day long. If I say, I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire, shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whispering, terror is on every side. Denounce him, let us denounce him, say all my close friends, watching for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived." then we can overcome him and take our, ref, rev, our revenge on him. Jeremiah laments, I don't want this word to be true. And yet my friends mock me. That There's a coming judgment. There's a coming destruction. There's a coming day of doom. And Jeremiah had said in chapter 25, verses 11 and 12, that this would not be just a short little blip in Israel's history but that it would be a serious issue. Jeremiah 25, verses 11 and 12, This whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then after 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans for their iniquity, declares the Lord. 
In all of this, Jeremiah is saying, the land that you have forsaken, all the years that God called you to give rest to the land, you haven't done that. And for every year that you did not give the land rest, the Lord is sending you into exile, 70 years. And you'll stay there, but then you will return. But since you're going into exile, what are you to do? In Jeremiah 29, we get this letter that Jeremiah writes. He writes it to all the officials who are in exile. And he says these words, beginning in verse 4, Jeremiah 29. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles to whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you Don't listen to the dreams that they dream, for it's a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. What is Jeremiah calling the people to do in the face of exile? The thing that God had commanded at the very beginning of creation. Be fruitful and multiply. Build houses. Plant vineyards. Have families. It's a mission. This is the missional call of Jeremiah. Exile does not mean surrender to the culture. Exile is a call for mission for the people of God. And the call to mission is have kids and teach them in the ways of the Lord. That's your first and biggest mission field. And then work hard. Because as you seek the the word welfare there is the word shalom or peace or well-being. As you seek the shalom of Babylon, it will be your shalom. When you're working for the good of the world, when you're doing your job with integrity, when you're working hard and trying to make a difference in your workplace because God has called you where you are, that's your mission field. That's your mission field in a world of exile. That you haven't been sent off and sent away to some hole in the ground where you surrender to the culture. You have been called to engage the world. And you engage the world by raising a family, loving your kids, teaching them well in the ways of the Lord, and working hard where God has planted you. This is not a surrender. This is about doing good works. As Martin Luther would say, God doesn't need your good works. But your neighbor does. And in a world that is increasingly confused and hurting and in pain, do you know what good work that you can do? Is do your job well. Nothing will speak volumes like your actions. And when you speak the word of Christ, there is a life that is backed up. It's backing up this word of of hope. That even though hell may seem to be prevailing, that you have the hope that God has sent you where you are. We work for a better day and we work hard. Why? Because all of these things are always intended to do one thing, is all of the Old Testament is pointing us to see, which is the glory of Christ. Jeremiah is not surrendering. But Jeremiah is given this very confusing word in Jeremiah 32. In Jeremiah 32, he's told, you need to go, the Lord tells him, you need to go and buy a field. And you need to buy a field outside of the city of Jerusalem. Now, if you're a real estate agent, and I know there's a couple real estate agents in the church, they would be saying, this is a bad plan. When you're in Jerusalem and the Babylonians are about to crush you, and you're going to go buy a field? That's just bad business. But the Lord says to Jeremiah, go and buy this field. And the Lord explains to him why at the end of Jeremiah 32. In verses 36 through 44, the Lord says, the reason I'm telling you, Jeremiah, to go and buy this field is because this is the message of hope, that I have given a a new covenant. 
Jeremiah 31, 31. A new covenant I declare to you, declares the Lord, that I will put my spirit within you. I will give you a new heart, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. And Jeremiah, by you buying this land, it's a signal that I will bring about my new covenant, that I will bring my people back to the land of promise. And when I bring them back, there will be hope and life and joy. So buy that land. And when Hebrews picks up Jeremiah's new covenant in Jeremiah 31, Hebrews 8 talks about this old covenant that didn't change people's hearts. It's done away with, and it's obsolete. But a new covenant has come, and this new covenant causes people to have a heart that will examine themselves, that they will be rescued from judgment, that there's a greater exile, a greater threat of exile, and it's not a mere 70 years. That, the, that Jesus would say, don't fear him who can destroy the body, but fear him who can cast body and soul into hell. Because the greater exile is an eternal exile. An exile of forever being separated from the joy of the Lord. And not knowing the love of God ever, but only knowing wrath for not examining your heart and blaming everybody else. Will the Lord deal with the nations? Jeremiah 36, 46 through 52 makes it clear He will. But as Hebrews sees it, this old covenant that couldn't change a heart, the new covenant has come. And that new covenant changes the hearts of all those who believe. And when it changes the hearts of those who believe, it causes a faith to issue forth, really, that in the midst of a world that is looking like decay and death, the, the word of the Lord actually brings a, a, an eye of faith. This is why in Hebrews 11, verse 10, we're told that it's Abraham was looking forward to the city that has its foundations, whose designer and builder is God. That Jerusalem would only last for a moment. The king of Salem... Melchizedek, as we saw in the video this morning, he's the king of Jerusalem, the city of peace. And he comes to bring this offering, and the Lord honors that offering, and forevermore, this city is the sign of a better city to come. That even while Babylon has closed in around Jerusalem, Abraham was looking forward to a better city, and Jeremiah was looking forward to a better city. A city whose builder and designer is God. That's why in verse 16 of Hebrews 11, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. And because they're looking forward to a better city, it's because that there is one who has come, we're told in Hebrews 12 verse 2, who for the joy set before him, endured the scorn and shame of the cross. That just as Jeremiah is the weeping prophet who laments over his city, the Lord Jesus looks at Jerusalem and he weeps over Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets. And what does he do? He willingly takes the wrath and scorn of that city upon himself by going to a cross, by enduring its shame. So the writer of Hebrews can say, In chapter 12, verse 3, consider him who endured from such sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. These are hard days. And the word of the Lord is that there is a sustaining word of grace for you. Consider Jesus. You'll be strengthened to live faithfully in these days. And you can live faithfully in these days. Why? Why? Because, as Hebrews 12, verses 18 through 24 says, For you have not come to may be touched, a blazing fire, and darkness and gloom, and a tempest, and the sound of trumpet, and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast, of, uh, even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the innumerable angels in festal gatherings, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, 
and to Jesus, the meteor, mediator of a new covenant, and, t- and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. This is the kingdom that we receive. It's a kingdom that can't be shaken. And we're working for a Jerusalem that will never be destroyed. Which is why in the book of Revelation, in Revelation 21, a Jerusalem descends from heaven. A new Jerusalem. A city, we're told, where there is no more weeping or sorrow or suffering. And in the midst of that, where there is no more weeping or sorrow or suffering, there is no more exile. It ends. There's no more separation from God ever. His presence is always with His people. But until that day, the writer of Hebrews says, consider how you may spur one another on in love and good deeds. Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25. Don't stop meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another all the more until you see the day, that day. And because of that day, we have this hope that this work that we are called to do today matters. Your work matters. Your job matters. Your service of your family matters. It is the call of every exile as we wait for the heavenly Jerusalem. That we work in this world so that the message of the good news that there is one who has come to rescue us when we are besieged all around us by evil. Evil will not prevail, but the gospel will. And that's good news. And so the Twin Towers may fall as a sign of judgment on corrupt systems of economics, and the Pentagon may have been hit by a plane showing that we have trusted in military might and not the Lord our God. But there is a city that is coming that will never be destroyed, whose builder and designer is God. And so we work now for that city. And we call others to join us in the journey to that city knowing that it will never be besieged, it will never be attacked, and one day we will enjoy the presence of the Lord forever. And so now we work for that city.